are still climbing into the room. The word is first to Maria Labayova, director of BAC. Thank you, Jonas. Um, welcome, welcome everybody to BAC, Basis for Actual Kunst here in Utrecht. My name is Maria Labayova, I'm artistic director of this place, and it's both great pleasure and privilege to welcome you all um, here on behalf of my team and myself um, on the occasion of the opening of the artistic project New World uh, Embassy Azawat, which is brought to life by Musa Ag Asarit and artist Jonas Stahl. This project is a culmination of a proposition that Jonas brought forth in his capacity as Buck Research Fellow this year within the long-term series, research series called Future Vocabularies, and in particular um, its entry on the notion of survival. Now survival at the point uh, when I believe we are parting from the legacy uh, of the modern, and I think that's a point where we in the world of art and world at large need to take a momentary pause and rethink that which we are doing. Rethink, retool, reorient, redo, sometimes even undo. And in the field of art that would very often mean that we simply need to leave behind some of the certainties upon which we based our operation in the field of art and try to walk towards new sort of alliances between the artistic and the political. Now, it's been, uh, it has been an extraordinary, if very challenging, undertaking um, to get us to this point. Surely, uh, New World Embassy Azawad is not a typical art project, a uh, political art project that would typically try to hide away in the symbolic safety of an art institution, away from the world it takes at its own theme. On the contrary, perhaps, it embodies a vision that we formulated for ourselves as Buck, which would be to create a space uh, within which one could negotiate various worldviews, or in other words, perhaps, um, make visible what an ideology or the ideology of the advanced capitalism tries try to keep uh, unseen, invisible. We have articulated for ourselves at the back uh, this philosophy as a philosophy of interlocution, of negotiating, of mediating, and I would like to thank Jonas and Musa for engaging with us uh, on this trajectory. Um, we're here for the inauguration of the New World Embassy of Azawad. As Maria said, my name is Jonas Stahl, and I'm going to try to give you a short introduction to the idea that is at the foundation of this first embassy of the unre unrecognized state of Azawad that was developed in collaboration, headed by writer and representative of the National Liberation Movement of Azawad, Mouvement National Liberation d'Azawad, Moussa Asarit, who is sitting here on the left of me. As some of you might know, I'm also the founder of the artistic and political organization, New World Summit. We are an organization of about 10 members who create from the field of art, architecture, design, philosophy, diplomacy, what we call parliaments for stateless and political, uh, blacklisted political groups worldwide. Here you see, for those who really want to exercise and turn around, because there will be many projections on all sides, on that wall, you see an impression of the very first parliament that we created in Berlin. We continue to do so in Leiden, in the Netherlands, in Cauchy, in India, and we're currently planning the fourth New World Summit in Brussels from the 19th to the 21st of September, where Musag Asarit will be a speaker as well. And our task has been to explore at what level art can be a space that can develop new forms of cultural and political representation. Uh, and as such, we facilitated here, you see some impressions, representatives of the National Democratic Movement of the Philippines, and I saw that its uh, current, one of its, one of its uh, intellectual leaders, Jose Maria, Professor Jose Maria Sison, is present also here with us tonight. Uh, we facilitated the Kurdish Women Movement, the Basque Independence Movement, and this very first summit that took place in Berlin in 2012 was also the first time I had a chance to meet Musa Ag Asarit, who came there 
only a month after the declaration of the new country of Azawad. And this new country of Azawad, that is what gathers us here tonight. And many of you might, at this moment, still be unfamiliar with its history. So in short, Azawad is a country north of Mali, about one and, a, one and a half times the size of France. And then I think only two days ago, Moussa said, maybe it's better to say it's uh, France and Belgium combined, but I don't think the Flemish movement would be very happy with this, this explanation. So I'll just say one and a half times the size of France. Its territory belongs to many different peoples, the Songhai, Fula, Arabs, and Tuareg. After colonization under French rule, at the end of the 19th century, Azawad already witnessed its first rebellions against the French colonizer, which continued after Mali gained independence in the 60s, um, which was backed, an independence that was backed uh, by French support. The rebellions, mainly led by the nomadic Tuareg, continued in 1963, 1990, 2006, and most recently, and most successfully, in 2012, when Aswadian fighters that came from the crumbling Gaddafi regime, as well as deserted soldiers from the Malian state, came together, came home with their weapons, and declared the new state of Azawad. So that is what the world has been witnessing in these last two years. A new but unrecognized state declared independence by a multi-ethnic coalition of Tuareg, Fula, Songhai, and Arab peoples gathered in the National Liberation Movement of Azawad. Now, in a moment, Musa Gassarit will introduce the status of Azawad today the many conflicts that have taken part since declaring its independence, when its organization, the MNLA, was confronted with jihadist groups in the territory, followed by the French mission Serval uh, in 2013, and the international MINUSMA mission of the United Nations, led by, and for many Dutch people this name will sound familiar, our former minister Bert Koenders. At this moment, 375 soldiers uh, are on Azawadian soil as part of the MINUSMA mission until 2015, the Dutch states investing 150 million until that time and 50 million years for each additional year that we would be staying there. This already in and of itself is a very good reason to be gathered here today and to understand more of the conflicts that the Dutch state has gotten itself involved in. Now the reason that we are gathered here today I think has much to do with the fact that both Musa and me are artists. Musa is a writer, I am a visual artist. We come obviously from highly different political contexts, we are shaped by very different histories, but we do believe, both believe, that the cultural and the political are related in a fundamental way. And this has created the basis for our exchange in the past two years with this project as its result. In the context of the creation of the new state of Azawad, we have referred to this exchange as the art of creating a new state, which is also the title of the book that each of you have, has gotten uh, upon entry with a collection of political and cultural texts from the new yet unacknowledged state of Azawad, from its declaration of independence to the work of its artists, its writers, and its musicians. This new state gathers us here today. We're even literally sitting around it. Many of you might not see it because of the seatings that you, are, that you ended up with, but this, this table is shaped after the new state of Azawad. It's situated in the larger map of the African continent, of which the lines you see all around you throughout this space. And around us on the walls are photos that Musa Asarit, Asarit took during the last combats that have been taking place between the MNLA and the Malian army uh, between the 17th and 21st of May 2014. And for those of you who absolutely have no perspective on how this space looks like, this is pretty much the top view of it. Only this summer, my colleague Yunus Buadi from the New World Summit uh, and documentary makers, filmmakers Gabrielle Provaas and Rob Schroeder, who I know were sitting there, uh, traveled with the MNLA to the state of Azawad in an attempt to understand the process in which a new state emerges. And this is pretty much the outlook of most of our days on the territory of Azawad. And what we witnessed there was an old state turning into a new one. The Azawadian flag that you see here painted on the water tower becoming 
a kind of collective canvas covering houses, signs, license plates, water towers, and even uniforms. We realized that in the context of national liberation, the creation of a state very different than colonial practices of occupation and administration is first of all a cultural expression. The creation of a state in the context of national liberation is first of all a cultural expression. Here, uh, in taking the shape of the murals of artist Mazou Ibrahim Touré, which we had the honor of meeting in Kidal. What we saw in this, the new state of Azawad were signs, symbols, historical narratives defended by artists and soldiers alike. And thus we witnessed the creation of the new state as something that we would consider as a collective work of art, a horizon, an imaginary, of insurgent histories as much as insurgent, insurgent futures, as Maria corrected me so good, so well this morning. So for this reason, we consider the space of Bach, where we are here, as the ideal space of creating a first embassy for the state of Azawad, as the place where the artistic and the political, where artistic and political struggle come together, and where we make visible the global battlefield that brings Dutch soldiers from the Netherlands to walk on Azawadian soil today. Now, some of you might ask, and this question has been asked a lot in these past days, is this a real embassy? Do we hand out visas? Or do we hand out passports? Do we have actual political power? Are we recognized by the state of the Netherlands? To those, I would ask a different question. I would ask, is Azawad a real country, even though no other country in the world acknowledges it. I would say that the reality of Azawad, as the reality is of many struggles for self-determination worldwide, is the reality of its peoples. It exists because its people exist. And through them, its heritage, its language, its shared histories, and its images, and the potential future that is gathered in all of them. So if an unacknowledged country can be real, then I would say its embassy can be real as well. <coughs> Art imagines the world anew, and now it's up to us to act upon what that imagination can bring us, to make a world, as writer Upton Sinclair has so beautifully said. And tonight we do so with politicians, diplomats, academics, and journalists here at this table, Mr. Van Dijk, Mr. Zandberg, Mr. Karskens, Ms. Demers, Mr. Ben Khalifa, thank you so much for being here and engaging on a critical debate on the birth of a new state. <coughs> just like Maria, there are some, I would like to thank some people just before I end. I want to thank the team of Buck again, Maria, Arjen, Nick, and Sema, who worked tirelessly and who proves themselves to be one of the few spaces in the ne Netherlands that have the courage from a cultural practice to do more than simply reflect on the world, but that want to engage in the process in which we can actually start changing it. I want to thank my team of the New World Summit, my head of research and production, Yunus Buadi, project coordinator, René Indemauer, who I think have abandoned the concepts of sleep and weekends and all the things that come with that to realize this embassy and prepare the New World Summit in Brussels. Architects, Paul Kuiper sitting there, designer Remco van Bladel. It was a fascinating process to go in the last month to engage with you on the question how an embassy, an unacknowledged embassy of an unacknowledged country could build a uh, structure for itself. I want to thank documentary filmmakers Gabrielle Provaas, Rob Schroeder. The work that they are doing, a film on the uh, current Azawadian struggle, fragments of it can be seen uh, upstairs on the first floor. We thank them for it, and we thank them for the discussion that they have started with us on how a new media would look for a new world. And last but not least, I want to thank writer and MNLA representative Moussa Asarid and the many colleagues that you have brought with you tonight who traveled all the way from France to be with us. It has been an honor to work with you. It's been an honor to have been your guest in Azawad. I sincerely hope you also continue to do us the honor to contributing to the art of creating a new state. And as you have explained me or exercised with me this morning, to you and your friends, I would like to say, Tana Merz y mi divan. And it brings me to the pleasure of handing over the word to our chair of this evening, 
a former war journalist and today a cultural journalist who brings the two worlds together that we've been trying to, to bring together in this space as well, Raymond van der Boogaard. Thank you. Uh, the idea is that we'll have a sort of roundtable discussion about uh, Azabad and, and, and related questions. Before we give the floor to uh, Musa, um, I'll quickly say who the participants in the discussion are. Um, they are Jasper van Dijk, who is an MP for the Socialist Party uh, in Dutch Parliament. Um, that is Jeroen Zandberg, for the, uh, the treasurer of the Unrepresented Nations and Peoples Organization. We'll get, what all this is, we'll see later. There's Arnold Kaskens, a hard-boiled war reporter, if I may say so. Um, we have Jolla Demers from the University of Utrecht, the Center for Conflict Studies. And we have Mr. Fatih Ben Khalifa, uh, who is president of the World Amazigh Congress. But all this is, we'll see later. And you will give, if, uh, you will give a short lecture to us, uh, introducing Azabad and the ideals and the, um, the struggle over there uh, to us under the title, The 21st Century Will Be the Century of Peoples, Not of States. Is that indeed? Yeah. Okay, go ahead, sir. Thank you very much. Ceci dit, le, la lutte du peuple multiethnique de la Zawad, parce que c'est important à, à connaître, à savoir, que, comme a dit Jonas tout à l'heure, les Azawadiens ne sont pas que des Touaregs. Il y a aussi des Songhai, des Peuls, des Arabes. Et tous ceux qui vivent chez nous, ou tous ceux qui vivent aussi chez eux, sans être de ces quatre euh, ethnies. Donc c'est un peuple qui se bat depuis très longtemps pour vivre librement et dignement sur le territoire de ses ancêtres. Ce peuple se bat non seulement contre l'oppression des hommes, mais aussi contre la dureté de la nature, donc du, du climat dans lequel les Azawadiens vivent depuis, enfin, sous lequel les Azawadiens vivent depuis très longtemps. Depuis 1958, on se bat pour, pour exister, tout simplement. Euh, dans le livre que vous avez, vous allez comprendre un peu l'histoire de, de la Zawad euh, et de son peuple qui se bat. Mais je voudrais juste vous rappeler qu'il y a eu, en plus des sécheresses qui se passent chaque environ dix ans, il y a eu des rébellions. Moi, je peux dire qu'il y a eu trois rébellions. 1963, 1990, 2006 et qui se déroule depuis 2012 in révolution. Depuis 2012, on peut dire que c'est une révolution populaire, multiethnique, pour l'existence de l'indépendance de la République de l'Azawad. Les trois premières révoltes ont été à chaque fois décimées dans le sang. Et beaucoup des combattants de 2012 sont des réfugiés, des exilés qui sont revenus soit des pays limitrophes, soit aussi des bien longtemps comme nous qui sommes en Europe, ceux qui sont là, moi je suis en France. Je ne peux pas dire que je suis exilé ni réfugié en France, mais c'est tout comme. Ce qui fonde le fond de toutes ces révoltes, c'est cette phrase que vous avez, que demande le peuple de la Zawad, qui demande à la France, parce que principalement c'est la France qui est responsable historiquement de ce qui nous est arrivé. Et c'est comme ça que, de, en 2012, depuis 2012, nous demandons à la France de réparer cette erreur. C'est-à-dire en 1958, des notables, des chefs traditionnels de l'Azawad, toutes ethnies confondues, ont demandé au président de la France de ne pas nous inclure dans le Soudan français et d'accepter l'indépendance de l'Azawad. Mais cette demande n'a pas été respectée et c'est devenu donc une erreur historique que la France et l'Europe assument. Ça s'appelait le Soudan français et qui est devenu en 1960, lors de l'indépendance, le Mali. 
Et donc, nous avons été inclus ou annexés par le Mali en 1960 à son indépendance. Il y a eu, après ces révoltes-là, avant 2012, des accords, des accords de paix, mais qui n'ont jamais été respectés. Et c'est comme ça que le MNLA, le Mouvement National de Libération de l'Azawad, s'est créé dans un contexte géopolitique assez particulier, donc en 2011, en octobre 2011. Lorsque le MNLA s'est créé avec des personnes, des combattants militaires qui étaient dans l'armée malienne et qui ont déserté l'armée malienne, et des combattants de double nationalité, libyenne et azawadienne, donc on va dire nationalité malienne parce que c'est le passeport qu'ils ont, mais en tout cas, ils sont d'origine azawadienne et qui, sont, qui se sont exilés, ou en tout cas qui, sont, qui se sont rendus en Libye, qui ont été euh, inclus dans l'armée libyenne en étant aussi des nationalités libyennes. Quand ils sont revenus, ils ont rencontré ceux qui sont revenus de, de Bamako, donc du Mali, et bien d'autres aussi qui ne sont pas des militaires comme moi ou tous ceux qui sont ici, pour créer le mouvement national de libération de l'Azawad. Pour permettre enfin au peuple de l'Azawad de pouvoir choisir son destin. Et c'est l'objectif, le but du mouvement national de libération de l'Azawad, l'indépendance de l'état de l'Azawad. Et pour cela, pour une des premières fois, il y a eu un équilibre qui a été mis en place entre la force de l'armée malienne et la force du mouvement national de libération de l'Azawad. C'est-à-dire qu'ils avaient à peu près le même équilibre militaire. Et en plus du fait que la population elle-même s'est mise en solidarité avec le mouvement national de libération de l'Azawad, et le contexte dont je vous parle, géopolitique, c'est le fait que depuis 2002-2003, avec la complicité de l'État malien, il y a des étrangers et aussi des locaux qui sont armés et qui ont un projet politique très différent du nôtre et que l'État malien a laissé proliférer et même à faire des affaires avec l'État malien. Et je vais parler d'Al-Qaïda au Maghreb islamique. Et avant ça, le GSPC, le groupement pour la prédication l'islam, prédication le GSPC, comme on dit, euh, dans le sud de l'Algérie. La, mmh. C'est ainsi que lorsque euh, les, les, les combats ont eu lieu entre les deux belligérants, le Mali et le MNLA, nous avons vu euh, proliférer à ce moment-là plusieurs branches, plusieurs ramifications d'Al-Qaïda qui nous ont combattus et avec lesquels nous nous sommes battus à ce moment-là sous le regard, le regard euh, silencieux de la communauté internationale. Et on se posait la question, pourquoi ils les battaient en Afghanistan et en Irak, mais chez nous, tant pis, ils ne font rien Pourquoi ils ne nous donnent pas les moyens de nous défendre et de défendre notre population C'était les questions que les Azouadiens se posaient. C'est ainsi qu'il euh, y a eu des acc un accord au mois de juin 2013. Juste avant, il y a eu l'intervention de l'armée française. Ensuite, il y a eu la CDAO, les, arm les armées africaines. Puis, depuis euh, le 1er juillet 2013, les casques bleus des Nations Unies, la MINUSMA, qui sont les, les soldats africains, se sont introduits, donc sont devenus des casques bleus. Et parmi ces casques bleus, bien sûr, il y a des Néerlandais qui sont aujourd'hui à Gao. Euh, donc c'est ça le contexte aussi de l'intervention internationale chez nous. L'obstination de la communauté internationale, c'était surtout comment faire revenir l'armée et l'administration malienne sur le territoire de la Zawad, qu'ils appellent abusivement le nord du Mali. Et la France, officiellement, pour son intervention qui a commencé le 11 janvier 2013, l'objectif, c'était de combattre les terroristes, les trois groupes terroristes qui ont attaqué Kona pour aller vers le sud, 
alors que le peuple souffrait depuis bien longtemps et on n'a pas vu grand-chose. Il n'y a pas eu de corridor humanitaire pour la population, donc il n'y a pas eu d'aide humanitaire vraiment sur, par rapport aux populations. Lorsque ces, ces différentes armées sont intervenues, à un moment donné, elles se sont posées la question « Mais avec qui combattons-nous vraiment ?» Et parce qu'ils ont vu la population qui soutient le MNLA. Ils ont vu la population se battre contre le, les, les terroristes. Alors, ils ont compris qu'ils avaient des ennemis communs avec le MNLA, mais aussi un intérêt, un intérêt général, celui de protéger la population. Donc, c'est dans ce, cette situation-là qu'avec les soldats néerlandais, les soldats hollandais et les soldats français et bien d'autres, il y a eu des connexions, il faut le dire, il y a eu des connexions pour dire, si vous voulez, le MNLA dit, si vous voulez protéger la population de la Zawad, alors nous devons travailler ensemble. Mais quel est l'embarras de ces soldats C'était le fait qu'ils représentent des États. Ils représentent des États et le, leur but à partir des États, c'est celui de défendre les intérêts de l'État. Mais le problème, c'est que l'État malien est perclu, c'est-à-dire est handicapé, n'a pas de pieds, donc il ne peut pas s'arrêter chez nous. Les soldats, les casques bleus, mais aussi l'armée française, ont, se sont rendus compte qu'en face, ils ont un, un peuple qui refuse cette administration et cette armée. Et vous avez ces, cette image, les casques bleus, face à la population qui leur dit « Azawad Malino ». Alors il y a eu un dysfonctionnement, on peut le dire, il y a un dysfonctionnement entre la vérité, la réalité sur le terrain qu'assistent les, ar qu les armées qui sont sur le terrain et les politiques, les États, le Conseil de sécurité des Nations Unies. Et c'est là qu'il faut se poser la question. Sommes-nous des défenseurs des peuples ou sommes-nous des défenseurs d'intérêts géopolitiques ou géostratégiques des pouvoirs au sommet des systèmes d'État Et ce que je peux appeler l'onde de choc, où le tremblement de terre s'est passé le 16, 17 et 21 mai 2014, lorsque le Premier ministre du Mali, avec une bonne partie de son gouvernement, ont décidé d'aller à Kidal, c'est-à-dire l'endroit où se trouve le, 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 le quartier général du MNLA. Et là, vous avez, ces images-là ont été prises lors de cette période-là, où finalement, la population a refusé d'accepter le retour et la présence du gouvernement du Mali à Kidal. Après que l'armée malienne ait tiré à balles réelles sur des femmes et des jeunes qui manifestaient, faisant des morts et des blessés, le 21 mai, le gouvernement, le Premier ministre, a donné ordre en déclarant sur les médias internationaux, notamment France 24, « Guerre totale contre le MNLA ». Et le 21 mai, il y a eu une défaite cuisante de l'armée malienne à Kidal. Et depuis lors, le territoire a commencé à respirer. Le territoire de la Zawad a commencé à respirer. Et c'est dans cette situation-là aussi que nous avons dit « Mais ». Est-ce qu'on ne peut pas trouver une oreille plus attentive que les soldats des casques bleus Certains sont bien gentils, bien sûr, comme les, les Burkinabés, les, les Hollandais, euh, certains Rwandais, les Tchadiens. Mais n'y a-t-il pas des peuples ou des personnes de bonne volonté qui peuvent nous écouter, écouter nos souffrances, regarder ce qu'on leur montre Et c'est ainsi que nous avons pensé à la solidarité entre les peuples. Aujourd'hui, nous croyons plus à la solidarité entre les peuples qu'à la solidarité des États ou des armées. Merci beaucoup. OK. Um, let's get back to the round. Uh, Joshua von Dijk, who was an MP for the Socialist Party in Dutch Parliament, Uh, spokesman on foreign affairs and culture and lots of other things. Um, and your party was against sending Dutch soldiers to Mali. 
I'd like to tell you something about my party's view on military missions in general, first of all. Because my party, the Socialist Party, is very cautious on military missions in general. We've seen several dramatic examples the last 10, 20 years of military interventions like Afghanistan and Iraq. In our eyes, uh, there was no substantial progress. Um, and sustainable solutions can hardly be reached by military interventions. Today, there's a huge debate going on, everybody knows, about the Ukraine and the uh, IS, Islamic State. Um, and for Ukraine, we don't believe in a new Cold War logic. We defend a few from a distance. Two sides, you can see, trying to get influence in Ukraine. Putin, on the one hand, the European Union and the NATO, on the other hand, and we condemn both sides an urge for a diplomatic solution. For the Islam Islamic State, ultimately, the same logic counts. There is no military solution on the long term. On the contrary, the involvement of the United States looks like a flashback to 2003, uh, when it happens again. Uh, and when you read the newspapers, it could happen soon. Now for Mali. Last year, the Netherlands was asked to join the UN mission MINUSMA. And in our party, we had a long discussion um, because it's a broadly supported mission by the United Nations with a broadly supported mandate. But then the questions came in my party. How realistic is the goal of the United Nations? Restoration of state authority how to avoid a new, long, lengthy presence of Western countries in, in this case, an African country. Sorry, no, I'm just saying to the okay. cameraman, sorry. In, 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 a, in a foreign country. How about the neutrality or the imp impartiality of the UN forces when they're cooperating with the Mali government and the Mali army? Who, who is, after all, the enemy? Who are we fighting against? How can we fight and negotiate at the same time with the same people? After all, reconciliation is needed for all parties, or at least cooperation well, all, for all different groups in Mali. So we urge for more humanitarian aid and for diplomatic efforts. And now I heard that in July 24, a roadmap for negotiations is set out. That's what the Dutch government wrote in answer to my questions. I'd like to hear your opinion on that. What are the perspectives for peace, for reconciliation, and for autonomy? To what extent can your demands be fulfilled? Now, finally, um, two things about your new embassy and the country of Azawad. I understand your movement, and I'd like to state that the, the current borders of Mali were drawn by colonial powers. Secondly, I'd like to state that it's, in my opinion, not to the Netherlands, it's not up to the United States or to, the, to my party, to define or create new states, especially not the one you're talking about. States are defined by their people, primarily. And to me, if you ask me what is important to me, a sustainable, workable solution is important. And I hope you reach that point soon. Thank you. Um, <laughs> To what extent, as a, as a politician, um, you could imagine sending out Dutch troops or UN in a UN uh, mission and then um, supporting uh, a separatist movement like this one is, after all? Is, th is that feasible? Uh, it's a difficult question because, um, first of all, to, 
to my party, uh, it's important. What is what is the mandate of a mission, of a military mm -hmm. mission? Is the United Nations um, approving it? Um, what are the goals? As I said, the goal of res restoring state authority is really a ambitious goal, which takes probably years and years. Look at Iraq and Afghanistan. Those were failed missions in my eyes. Mm -hmm. Can we support a, um, uh, a specific group within a country or a, a territory? It's, it's a difficult question. Uh, that's what I'm really curious to hear from you, a, a bit like your question. Uh, what, uh, how many people are supporting your movement? What's, your, what's the number of people in the territory behind your movement, because that is, I think, a very uh, essential point in um, supporting your movement and creating mm -hmm. a new state. Can you give us the figures, Musa? Uh, Il n'y a jamais eu de, de, de vote d'élection. Alors, nous demandons l'autodétermination pour que le peuple s'exprime sur ce qu'il veut que ce soit ceux de Gao, de Kidal, de Tombouctou, de Menaka, qu'on puisse, comme d'ailleurs ce qui va se passer en Écosse la semaine prochaine, est-ce que le Parti socialiste ou euh, les États de façon générale ne peuvent pas permettre à des peuples qui se battent pour leur autodétermination d'avoir la chance et le, la possibilité de, de s'exprimer Donc, nous, nous n'avons pas participé aux élections des mascarades d'élections qui se sont passées pour élire le président de la République du Mali, les députés maliens, mais le jour où il y aura un référendum d'autodétermination du peuple de l'Azawad, à ce moment-là, ceux qui veulent l'indépendance, ils vont choisir, et ceux qui ne veulent pas l'indépendance, ils vont le choisir. Nous, le MNLA, nous le respecterons, et nous demandons d'ailleurs un référendum d'autodétermination. C'est ce que nous voulons. Le MNLA ne prétend pas avoir le soutien de, tout, de toutes les populations, de tout le peuple de la Zawad. Nous sommes un mouvement, donc une organisation, comme toute organisation dans le monde. Par exemple, en France, le président français ou le président d'ici, enfin, ou, ou le premier ministre, n'ont pas 100% de la population. Je ne connais pas, surtout en, dans le, le système démocratique, quand il y a une organisation qui a 100% de la population. Peut-être que nous aurons 60%, 70%, mais c'est très bien déjà. Est-ce qu'il y a un parlement au Mali Est-ce qu'il y a un parlement central au Mali Il y a, oui, il y a un parlement. Since you mentioned the example of Scotland, would you be uh, willing to, to, to participate in general elections in Mali and sending delegates to this parliament in order to further your cause? No, not in the context actuel. But si à la suite des negotiations qui se déroulent actuellement à Alger, la solution c'est-à-dire on s'est entendu sur l'organisation d'un référendum d'autodétermination c'est une très bonne chose on verra l'issue de, de ce référendum et puis dire euh, par rapport à sa question euh, par rapport à la feuille de route qui a été signée le 24 juillet dernier actuellement il y a des négociations entre les représentants du gouvernement du Mali et le MNLA et d'autres mouvements qui sont belligérants, qui sont euh, belligérants avec le, euh, avec le Mali, en négociation à Alger actuellement. Let's try and broaden the um, <coughs> discussion with um, Jeroen Zandberg, who is the treasurer of the Unrepresented Nations and Peoples Organization UNPO, uh, which is an organization that has 42 members. No, 46 now. <coughs> 46 now. Yeah. Uh, is uh, Azabad? Um, uh, Azabad is not a member of UNPO, um, but currently we have 46 members. Uh, we are uh, discussing with Azabad, and perhaps we will cooperate with them in the future. Um, I'll uh, like to uh, present my speech. 
Right. Yeah. Uh, good evening. Um, my name is uh, Jeroen Zandberg. Uh, I'm representing the Unrepresented Nations and Peoples Organization. Um, I've worked for the UNPO for many years and worked with uh, many different nations and peoples. Uh, the UNPO is a membership organization of indigenous peoples, occupied nations, and unrecognized states. So not just uh, states. Uh, it was established on 11 February 1991 in the Peace Palace in The Hague. Um, it was established by treaty as an international organization, but by members who are not recognized by uh, the United Nations, like Estonia, Latvia, and uh, government in exile of Tibet. Um, <clears throat> at the moment, we have 46 members, uh, and they differ greatly in what they want and who they are. Um, <clears throat> the members fall into three broad categories, namely de facto independent states, uh, occupied nations and minorities, and indigenous peoples. And I would say that uh, Azawad would not be an uh, independent state, but an occupied nation or minority. Um, <clears throat> to start with uh, the de facto independent states, uh, currently we have four uh, de facto states as a UNPO member. They are Abkhazia, Somaliland, Taiwan, and Kosovo. Um, the issues that those members basically focus on are international recognition and economic development. Um, <clears throat> Abkhazia, for example, is recognized by only four UN countries, by Russia, uh, Nicaragua, Venezuela, and a very small nation, Nauru. Uh, and Kosovo is recognized by 108 UN countries. Uh, which is still not enough to be accepted by the General Assembly because you need two-thirds of all the members to uh, be accepted to the General Assembly. Um, <clears throat> it is therefore very hard for a de facto state to become recognized as an independent state by, other, uh, by the UN itself. Um, <clears throat> most of the UNPO members um, are not de facto states. We only have four at the moment, but... Uh, about 40 of our, our members are occupied nations and minorities. Some of them strive to become a state, but others uh, look for ways of self-determination in a different way. Um, <clears throat> one of the, our main principles of UNPO is self-determination, uh, but uh, self-determination does not mean that a people has the right to an independent state. Uh, there are some criteria for it, uh, and they're also very political. Um, <clears throat> Um, so what we usually focus on when we talk about self-determination in UNPO is uh, in, in autonomy, in, uh, in internal autonomy within the state, uh, more human rights, more cultural rights, more language rights. Um, <clears throat> and then the third, third uh, group that is a member of UNPO is the indigenous peoples. So they are the, uh, like the, <clears throat> the Batwa in the Central Africa who live in the in the forests or the Mapuche in South America. Uh, they are usually very few in numbers, usually hundreds or a few thousands, and they have uh, very few resources. Um, they are very dependent on their environment, so uh, our focus supporting indigenous peoples is really uh, supporting um, the environmental protection and uh, supporting their language and culture. Uh, one of the one of the main issues of UNPO is self-determination, but we also focus a lot on non-violence um, because it's very important for the UNPO as, as an organization to function that the members of UNPO uh, have a non-violent political uh, activity. Firstly, it's very important for UNPO because we need to work uh, in international structures, and if you are uh, not ab abiding by non-violence, then you cannot, be, uh, you cannot lobby for your case. Um, another uh, reason why we lobby uh, a lot for nonviolence um, is and the peoples itself. It's because they don't have the the, the means to be uh, to uh, many nations and peoples are confronted with state oppression, often via military means. An all too human reaction to physical oppression is to react with force and try to stop this <coughs> violence. Uh, there are many examples, of course, of this in this wor in this world. Um, and at UNPO, we always try to convince people uh, with trainings and all those things that is almost always a bad strategy uh, because you can never uh, <clears throat> be equal in that sense because there's also always a big imbalance of power. 
Uh, so it's always we always uh, try to convince them that it's better to use the uh, international uh, conflict mediation uh, opportunities that are available because there are a lot of UN mechanisms uh, focusing on human and cultural rights. Um, <clears throat> that's a very important reason why we do that. Another reason why we advocate nonviolent action is because it makes the struggle for self-determination of a people uh, more inclusive. Uh, because violence uh, usually means that the average person is unable to be part of the movement because they don't have the capacity or willingness to be uh, a rebel fighter. This means that the majority then become spectators instead of actors in the struggle for self-determination, which means that the organization usually loses its uh, base, and uh, <clears throat> which makes it much easier for the state to, uh, to stop any self-determination of their people. And your aim is to to represent the interests of your members or to lobby for them? Or, uh, yeah, or? it's it's a truly a membership organization, that meaning uh, that it's really the members who decide the strategy. Uh, there's a general assembly every two years, and then they elect uh, a general secretary and a treasurer to do the executive, and then you have the presidency plus the board, the president plus the presidency, which is the, is the mm -hmm. board. Um, <clears throat> and then the, what we do is... Uh, um, uh, well, we have meetings, we have conferences, we uh, 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 a lot in the European Parliament. Uh, we, okay. uh, um, and usually we do that on, based on what they want, because uh -huh. we have 46 members, so a lot of different, um, <clears throat> different questions from them. Uh, so uh, really based on what they want. Uh, for example, we have a few members in uh, North Iraq, like Assyrians, uh, Iraqi Turkmen, and uh, the uh -huh. Kurds in Iraq. So right now we're very busy with that, uh, organizing lobby meetings in, uh, in Washington. And uh, um, yeah. That, for example, which Kurds would be a member? The Barzani Kurds, or the PKK, or all the Kurds? Uh, no. uh, well, um, uh, right now we have the Iraqi, uh, Iraqi Kurdistan as a member and Iranian Kurdistan. Uh, as a territory. As a territory. And mm -hmm. uh, actually they were a founding member of UNPO, so they've been a member since 1991. And currently it's the Kurdish regional government who is a member of UNPO. So they're representing the region of uh, northern Iraq, of, of Kurdistan. In Iran we have the PDKI. Uh, the Kurds in Iraq are not a member, uh, in Kurds in Turkey are not a member of UNPO. So not the PKK. Um, yeah, so we work a lot with uh, the KRG, who is not uh, now from, a member. From your point of view, what would your impression be of Azawad as a... Well, as Azawad, a it's, of course, it's not a state in the sense that it has really uh, the control of the territory, because it's one of the definitions of a state that it controls the territory. Um, <clears throat> so it does not fall into that category, but it's really an, uh, well, what we would say an occupied nation from our perspective, or minority. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, what would be uh, feasible right now would be, of course, uh, strive for more autonomy, uh, uh, more cultural rights, uh, more based, more like that, instead of international recognition. Because okay. I, well, right now that would be very hard. Because even the, like Abkhazia, which has been independent for more than 20 years, uh, there are only four members who, of the UN who recognize it. So. It's very hard. You say that you prefer your members to be non-violent, right? Yeah. Well, we, uh, well, well, we, we demand from Practically it. every example one can think of is a, is a military uh, organization. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's no, no. no. <clears throat> um, uh, they have to reject terrorism. And uh, non-violence, of course, it, it, there's also, it means that you... Have, uh, it doesn't mean you, that you don't do anything. It just mean, yeah. doesn't mean you should uh, not be focused at military conflict. Um, uh -huh. Of course, uh, like Abkhazia or Somaliland, they all have armies. So in that yeah. sense, they c can have violence, but they are not. F they don't. Um, <clears throat> they don't try to get their objectives through violence. That's not their main uh, okay. thing. So that's uh, yeah, non-violence. It's of course, it's based on the Gandhian principle that we use, um, but. Uh, it did not all the members really abide by it, or we try to, uh, yeah, do that at least. Okay. Um, okay. Let's uh, let's mm -hmm. go to Arnold. Uh, what what uh, Arnold Kaskins is, a, as I said, a hard-boiled war reporter um, and an independent journalist, and 
Nice guy. Okay. <laughs> More or less, yeah. But it, he, he uh, I'm very principled because he refuses to uh, go on, on um, as a war reporter on embedded missions, right. which is why yes. in... Uh, I'm independent. Uh, what is your take on Azawa? Um, well, I, I will come to that. First, first I want to say some things. Uh, you already introduced myself. Um, I am more than 30 years a uh, war correspondent, so I, I visit a lot of unrepresented nations uh, along this time, and I was always very happy to be there for two reasons, uh, because it's the duty of a journalist to write the sentence that not has been written, so you can always bring some news. And people were always happy to see me, and that not always happens in other places. <laughs> so um, I, I, I want to make three points. I don't want to make it too long. You can always ask me afterwards. Three points about um, represented nations like Asawat. Uh, it's a point of questions and demands. You know, in, in, in this world of journalism, it's always like, you know, the more influence you have on on, in, in politics, the more attention you get from the media. So you see Barack Obama all the time on the news, even if he plays golf or plays with his kids. And it's for nations like Asawat much more difficult to get this attention. Unless you become part of the political game. You saw that with the Palestinians in the 70s, you know, when they were doing these attacks on, on, on Israeli soil. Then they get the attention of the media. You saw the same with the uh, Amasis, the Berbers in, in, in Libya, when I was there uh, in 2011, because they were a very strong part fighting uh, uh, Muammar Gaddafi in Tripoli. So at that time, you know, nobody, before that nobody cared about them, but then they become very influential because they were supporting uh, the Western um, political goal to uh, get rid of uh, Gaddafi. Now you see the same in 2014. The journalists are interested in these small peoples, the small uh, nations, like for example the Syrians and the Kurds, because they are a part of the international political game. So, okay. And that's a little bit the problem with Asawat. How do you get the attention? How do you get? Um, it is the role of the reporter eh, to tell the unembedded story. It is very important to get off the road where all the main media storytellers try to put you on. So. It's very important for the media not to follow uh, uh, Barack Obama on his election campaign. You need for this sort of countries, you know, and it's not only as a what, but it's in other 45 states as well, is to get those people to, uh, to tell this story that has not been written yet. And I give you a few PowerPoints how you can do this, get the attention for as a what, because by this attention, people can discuss about, you know, is, if it's worthwhile to get this free nation or not. Well, one of the things is organized events, evenings like this. It's very important to get your struggle here in the Netherlands. So we can talk about it in the sort of table. That's very important. Very important as well, organized trips for journalists, but for artists as well, to show what you have to show. I remember I was in Eritrea in 90, now no, in 83, in 83, or 82 even. And I was there, it's a part of, at that time it was a part of Ethiopia. And I went there because they invited me. It was very easy to come, to go there. And there was, a, the, they were fighting uh, the Ethiopian uh, soldiers. And at that time I was thinking, well, you know, they're fighting, but they will never get the independence. And they got it in 91 because they were supporting uh, the, the media to cover their story. And that's, that's very, very important to get your message out. So, and for, if, if you don't support the, the media, it's um, almost impossible to go there by yourself. You, you need the support. And, um, and that is how I got to Asawat as well uh, in, um, in March 
uh, the MINUSMA flew me into uh, Kidal, and, and we organized by telephone a meeting with the people of Asawat, and they were, you know, showing me around what they had to show. So I could get this message out, what, what, what you were trying to go uh, in, in, in your struggle, and how you were um, take sides in this conflict towards uh, UN and, and the Al-Qaeda movements. But on the other hand, that's point three I want to make as well, and that's for concerning Asawat, but for all these uh, unprecedented nations. It's, um, you know, that sort of people and countries existed before the first newspaper was printed. So don't, that's what I, what I want to say, is don't exaggerate the power of the media. It's always very important, more important, that you have your own vision, your own goal, and not try to be independent on the media, and especially not the independent media. So if you say, well, we can do it without it, it's the best, but if you can get the help of the media, it's very important, because I always say, as long as a journalist can come to a country, it means at least, you know, it's, 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 it's not a concentration camp. And um, like, like, like right now in, in the Islamic State uh, in, in Syria and Iraq, they get the people, the worldwide population against them and you try to prevent them. So open your doors, let them show you have nothing to hide. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then the people can make their own opinion. The international media, the international people, and, and your own people, they can show what's, what's going on. So um, the most important thing is your ideology, your goal, and the media will write about it. So that's what I want to say. To, to what extent, um, giving all this good advice, to, mm -hmm. to what ex extent do you sympathize with the cause? Well, I, I, I sympathize with everybody, <laughs> with, uh, uh, with, with all the nations I've visited, and I've visited about 100 countries, and, and uh, I always am in favor of the people I'm visiting. Mm -hmm. And as long as I have the idea that the, the, the people of Asawat, and I spoke a lot of Tuareg, and they were supporting their own, you know, their own independence. And, and who am I to say, well, you don't deserve it? And it's, if it's done by a sort of, let's say, honest way, and I can, then can I write about it? And if it's not, I have to write it about it as well, because that's another thing I always want to say. At the beginning of my career, I visited uh, Central America. You had a, this guerrilla fighting in El Salvador and countries like that. And I was very pro-guerrilla, because I was a left-wing boy, and I was you know, trying to help them by writing uh, stories that were very in favor of them. But then after... Half a year, one year, I said, no, I make a mistake. It's much better for an independent journalist to write very critical about these guerrilla movements as well. Because if I am writing very popular and, 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 and write the way they would like, I would write that they are you know, they're great people, then I don't give them the advice, I don't give them the critics they need to get a better organization. Mm -hmm. So. That's how I write about Asawat as well. You know, they, 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 the thing is now that there's a lot of people in Gao, for example, that are still very afraid because they, they, they say, well, Asawat and Al-Qaeda is almost the same. So you have to distinguish very much from all the extremists, yeah? And you have to repeat the story all the time. So the people in, for example, Gao, but Timbuktu as well, know that, you know, you, you have the best ideas for the future of this whole part of, uh, of uh, Mali. To, uh, since you've been witness in, in the area, yeah. uh, one of the main, of course, um, um, uh, things that has been put forward is that um, the, the different foreign troops who are there and who are all supporting the integrity of the Malian state, uh, in fact, uh, have a suppressing effect on the population of Azawad, which would be better off if they would have autonomy. Is, 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 was this your impression as well, that in fact the, the foreign military presence um, 
is supporting a Malian army that in itself is a war party suppressing the people of the um, Partly, because there was a very good connection between the MNLA and, and the MINUSMA, because they, they had regular contacts mm -hmm. and uh, we were not shot at or things like that. So, um, uh, so I, I think they, the, the organization was, was quite well. And the other one is how do people think about the MNLA? That's what you mean? No, no, no. <clears throat> the main accusation here has been actually that the foreign troops support the Malian army and that the Malian army is a suppressive yeah, factor. Yeah, but the, 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 fi the, the thing North. is, what, 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 and I know it from, I was there before as well, I was in 2000, that. Uh, in Gao, for example, they are not very pro uh, MNLA, a lot of people, but they even you know, dislike the government in Bamago as well because they think, well, we are in the north and we don't get the support we actually should get from, from the, the, the central government. Mm -hmm. So actually, and, 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 and the MNLA should use this. They, they're balancing, you know, well, they're not taking right. one side or the, or the other side. So you have all the possibility to, to you get this sort of people on your side, yeah, if you want that, and, and, and try uh, to, that they give them um, the, their support to, you, to your organization. Okay. So that's, the, 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 I just want to say that uh, my opinion is that a lot of people in the North, they dislike what they call the black population in the south. And that's from ages and ages on. So, uh, and, and I think that's one of the reasons that uh, the MNLA has uh, support from uh, a lot of people in the north, from the Tuareg especially. Okay. Um, Jolle Demers, yeah. you write and lecture on theories of violent conflict, the role of diaspora in violent conflict, and the ethnographies of neoliberalism. Well, what are the ethnographies of neoliberalism? Well, that's for another session, I think. That's another session. Yeah. Okay. We what what does that. the present debate inspire you? Yeah, well, I, I think I'm going to take it a bit, um, I'm going to zoom out a bit and um, talk on a more abstract level. Maybe, maybe sort of turn the gaze back to the, to the walls around us, too. Um, because I think the, the gaze of the artist, the gaze of, of Jonas, and um, the ethnographer scientist or the anthropologist, the conflict analyst, is really not that different. Um, both aim to, questions, to question the categorization that we, that the categorizations that we live by. And um, what we may call a phenomenology of war is very close to what art is about, I think. That is, to look at things, to look at phenomena as if we see them for the first time. That is what I tell my students, try and look at the world as if you've just landed from Mars. And I'm sure the art students in the room have had that experience too in, in school. Uh, destabilize stable meanings in the shadow of powerful explanations. Study also the built environment and question how space generates a certain form of being, a certain form of subjectivity. Who's welcomed and who's expelled? What are the rules of the game? Take nothing for granted and question everything. This project, as I see it, helps us to explore the spatial dimension, as we academics would call it, of the mechanisms of governance deployed by parties in the Azawad conflict to secure their legitimacy, naturalize their authority, and, and to represent themselves as superior to rivaling political campaigns. Parties and conflicts always are, in a way, constructed entities um, that are made socially affected through all these imaginative and symbolic devices. Through images, and we see them all around us, metaphors and performative practices, actors in conflict aim to represent themselves as real, as tangible entities with spatial properties, and through that claim legitimacy, because that's what we're talking about here, I think, this evening. And what we see here, in a way, is constructivism stretched to its limits. A phenomena <coughs> may be constructed, that is imagined, but as soon as people start to act upon an imagined phenomena, it becomes real in its consequences. 
a large part, I think, of bluffing the state of Azawat is to make it real through mimicking the routines of statehood we see elsewhere in great detail. The paraphernalia of statehood, the flag signaling the border crossing over there, I think a very strong image in the beginning. Um, the newly made stamp in Jonah's passport. Uh, the monuments, the checkpoints, they all try and discipline us to yeah, discipline us in a way into the scripts and routines of Azawad statehood. And of course the embassy embodies this idea. Now the literature on state spatiality offers a new and distinct research methodology well suited to the analysis of the spatial strategies deployed by a whole range of agents in their efforts to produce or erase the nation, the notion of Azawad as an independent state. For no doubt that little flag will become a target. It will be seen as a provocation, labeled as terrorist or banditry and removed, and it will be planted back. Through architectural design, security devices and multiple bureaucratic rituals and routines, authorities from all sides aim to claim space and produce subjectivities in highly contested ways. And interestingly, they will also do this now in the name of the Dutch public or in the name of Dutch national security or in the name of Dutch uh, claims to gas resources in the region. Very important issue. The point of departure of this project, I think, is that architectural forms and our built environments, monuments, bridges, public squares, border crossings, shopping malls, churches, have political and economic impacts on the social systems in which they operate. Buildings, including this embassy, offer cues suggesting how people should act. They tell us about our relationship with one another. The idea is then to read society through its buildings, and in the case of Azawad, its built environment. So how is then space demarcated, appropriated, claimed, and transformed into particular places by different actors? How do individuals and organizations in conflict establish these spatial claims to authority? And how are they you know, adopted, contested, rejected, resisted? The case of Azawad informs us on how control is exercised through the management of space. It reminds me of a lot of other cases of state building and of forms of hybrid states that we at the Center for Conflict Studies research. Uh, the Zapatistas in Mexico and the La Condona jungle, the case of Kosovo, South Sudan, Abkhazia. In all these cases, imagining the state through the production of state effect was of utmost importance. Uh, I want you to show you an example of, um, of Abkhazia. It's already mentioned earlier. Maybe you know it's a bit of a difficult region. This is the map of Abkhazia. Um, um, Abkhazia separated from larger Georgia in the 1990s, and it's one of these frozen conflicts that's still sitting there. And uh, on the next slide, you'll see um, the highway coming out of Tbilisi, and Tbilisi is the capital of Georgia. And if you look at the sign, you see <coughs> the, the, the sign stating that um, one of the destinations of the highway is Sochum. And Sochum is the capital of Abkhazia. Now, um, what we see on the sign is that it, it makes us feel as if we can travel to Sochum without any problem. This is just a city further down the road within Georgia. So it's a form of imagined access. However, then if we go to the next slide, we enter the bridge crossing the Inguri River. We run, and that's this, the, the river that separates the two territories. We run into a fully militarized international border where one is not allowed to enter if not carrying the right papers. So we're subjected into a position of the foreigner and the migrant. And this has been the case since the 1990s. Uh, two remarks I'd like to make uh, in reference to, to Azawad. Um, what, of, of course, is fascinating is to see what are the next steps of spatialization. So what comes after the little flag? Um, first, I want to say something about the role of the market. And interestingly, we in the Netherlands or in the former West 
uh, we see a reverse of state spatiality. Icons of statehood such as borders, but also railways and post offices and telephone booths and trams and buses have been privatized and turned into corporate brands. Citizenship here is not primarily realized in relation with the state or the participation in a public sphere. Citizenship rather now entails active engagement in a variety of private, corporate, and quasi-corporate practices, of which working and shopping are paradigmatic. In many ways, we are all stateless. For the role of the state now is to facilitate the market first and foremost. So how to build what kind of statehood in the era of global capitalism? I think that's one of the pressing questions for a new state to think about. And for the second point, I go back to a more classic view of the state. Here the state, Charles Tilly, is seen as an autonomous organization successfully claiming priority in the use of force, a monopoly on the use of violence, within a larger and clearly bounded territory. How and where and when is the use of force legitimate? Who has the moral right to claim this priority? On whose behalf? Who are the people? the most abused world, I think, word in, in a lot of politics, I think. For although the ideas presented in this project speak of poetry and art, creating a new state is also about killing and dying. Claiming a territory as one's own, upon which so many interests are projected as that of Northern Mali Azawad, including those of the Dutch public, will involve the use of violence and bloodshed. It does involve becoming part of a project which is ugly and difficult to control, which is easily corrupted and in need of constant critique. I'm not sure if, if and how that critique is going to come from us, the consumer citizens of the former West, but we're part of this now. This concerns us directly. And I'd be very interested to see what this embassy is, um, is doing to you, you know, the public. Uh, what it is that we learn here and what it is that we take away with us. And today is, I think, only the beginning of that conversation. So thank you for joining. Can I ask you a small question? Uh, the, um, the idea behind foreign intervention, like the one in Mali, for example, um, in general is to freeze the situation, tear out the... the, the the problem. But where do you get the assumption from that an in foreign intervention or humanitarian intervention, a military intervention, is driven by some sort of interest to stop violence? Because that's a, well, that's in the case of Mali, the share. idea is to 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 kick out the um, uh, what they call the terrorists, etc., and restore the Malian state. But that's a story. That's mm -hmm. a narrative. That's a narrative. I don't I don't see supported by any kind of evidence. You don't buy that. I don't buy that, no. And I think exactly we should be here to question these kinds of stories. This is clearly what I started out with. This is clearly the, the, the narrative that's been told to us, that we're going to do good. And I think it's important to question those narratives. Okay. Yeah. So. We'll get to the audience questions afterwards. We have good. one more speaker. Um, and I thought I would get back to my uh, Fatih Ben Khalifa. You are the president of the World Amazi Congress. You are from Libya. Um, you lived in Morocco for 16 years because you couldn't live in Libya, I presume. Um, and then you left for the Netherlands. Um, and you now resumed your uh, dissident activities from, from Tunisia. But um, in short, explain to us what is the World Amazigh Congress? And then, of course, your impressions about this Yeah, good evening, first of all, for everybody. Uh, I would like to thank the New World Embassy for inviting me, and thank you again for this great job. CMA, uh, Congress Mondial Amazigh, or World Amazigh Congress, it's an international organization um, defending Amazigh rights. And we try through this organization present Amazigh identity and culture. 
So uh, established in 1995, our organization, our local, it's in Paris. Uh, why in Paris? Because no one of North African countries um, can already to give us authorization to be uh, or to establish it in our own land. So uh, I am ex-president of this organization since two weeks ago. So uh, if I can continue yeah, my presentation. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> yes, uh, that must have been a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's great. I am I'm Amazir from Libya. Uh, when we talk about the Amazir people their culture and identity and rights. We are talking about a group of people that exceed 60 million persons living in countries of North Africa. Start from Egypt, through Libya, Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, Mauritania, and state of itinerary, countries of Grand Sahara, Azawad, Niger, Burkina Faso, and also north of Chad and Sudan. Also, uh, Canary Islands, and also uh, millions of Imazirun in Europe and North America. For example, here in Holland, you have around a half million of Imazirun, but you call them just Moroccans or Muslims or Arabs, because you must. Uh, you, uh, you believe that uh, our countries are Arabic ones. In reality, these countries are Amazigh countries, and their people <laughs> are also Amazigh people, but they are under colonialism and do not have the reins on their political affairs and on the right to express themselves as they are in reality. More than <laughs> 60 million Amazigh live their daily lives in their own lands according to their historical identity, their mother tongue, and their artistic, traditional, and musical heritage, but are still officially and on a global scale part of Arab world, or part of Mali, <coughs> or part of Spain. Even the revolutions, the revolutions which are still being pairing with their own blood, in order to get rid of the Arabic colonialism, are still being unanimously called the Arab Spring. In Tunisia and Libya, as our friend said, Amazigh people played a very important role for victory of this revolution. In Egypt, we saw Arabs and Copts, we saw Christians and Muslims, and so many people from Noba. In Syria, there is Kurds and Arabs, Muslim and Christians. In Azawad, Tuareg, Fulai, Sangai. So how came we can call this spring of freedom the Arab Spring? More than 60 million Amazigh are not recognized in the constitutions of their respective countries. None of the regimes in all North Africa, not in Mali, nor in Spain, has official statistics regarding Amazigh citizens. By dictatorship regime's laws, my people cannot even give Amazigh names to their children, even less for them to demand their independence and the formation of their own independent countries. Why is that? Because they are under colonialism. All colonialism regimes that prevail on the Amazigh land we call Tamazgha, since old history has ended, but the theorists among them, the Arabic and French colonialism still exist. The Arabic colonialism regime still exists because it dominated by force of arms, religion, and Arabic nationalist thoughts and ideology. The French one because it dominated by force of arms, economy, and political networks. Ladies and gentlemen, Explaining the issues that are clear, fair, and legitimate would only increase in their com complexity and overlap. This is what's generally happening now in the Amazigh countries of Tamazgha and in Azawad as an example. The international community 
currently led by France, and countries in the region currently led by the military regime of Algeria exceed in explaining, interpreting, and intervening in Azawad only to ensure in complexity in order to ensure continued colonial dominance in direct and indirect forms. Azawad people of all beliefs aspire to freedom of self determination as they see it and as they wish. They are at home and did not assault anyone outside of their soil. Then, by what right would outsiders intervene in their matters? Simply and clearly. Those who really want to address terrorism and extremism based in some areas of the desert, why wouldn't they support the people of Azawad? Who, who's, who wants to address the heavy drug crimes and international traffic business, money laundering, which passes through the Sahara Desert, why not support people of Azawad? Those who want to address the illegal immigration from Africa to Europe, why not support the people of Azawad? Who's those who really want to support freedom, democracy, and stability in the region, why not support the people of Azawad? So many questions, no answers. Simply put, those who don't, do not want all of this will only lengthen the explanation, interpretation, and analysis, just like France is doing right now, and those that support it among the international community, unfortunately, including the Dutch government. Thank you again for the new World Embassy for this great, great job. Thank you very much. Okay, now we come to the point where the ad audience can ask questions. Go ahead, sir. Good evening. My name is, my name is Fred van der Kraai. I uh, know Mali from uh, various uh, experiences. I first visited in 1972 and I worked there in the 80s and the 90s. And the last visit was last year. I have a question to our main speaker. I uh, hear you say that you uh, are not I are in favor of the independence of Azawa, and that is obvious from this evening. But at this moment, there are peace negotiations. Excuse me. At this moment, there are peace negotiations in Algiers, and the official point of view of the MNLA uh, representative is: we do not uh, negotiate for <coughs> independence or autonomy. They have renounced on this on this issue. Even last year when Azawad was created in April 2013, a couple of months later when the region was overwhelmed by the other organizations, the, uh, in the call for independence was withdrawn from MNLA. So my question to you is, who do you represent? Do I have to believe you, or do I have to believe the representatives of MNLA in Algiers? I'm very confused in this moment. Secondly, uh, my colleague here asks you a question on the relations of MNLA with uh, other organizations. Now, in particular, Iyad Ag Ag Agali, you know very well, who signed the agreement of Algiers <coughs> in 1991. He was also related to the creation of MNLA. Nowadays, he is the leader of Anzadin. And there were reports that in May, when there were clashes between the Malian government and MNLA, that there were forces of Ansardin who had joined the fighting. So my, relation, my question would be to repeat the previous question, that is, what are the relations between people like, for instance, uh, Iyad Agali, who recently joined forces with one of the most uh, sought uh, terrorists in the Sahel, Mokhtar al -Mokhtar. Last question <laughs> is, that it's very important, what do you expect from Algiers? In Algiers, we have at this moment three groupings, armed groupings, MNLA, High Council, uh, HCUA, you were familiar with, and Mouvement Arabe Azawad, Arab. They are negotiating with the Malian government. But there are also the CPA, the MCFPR, and the, another spit off of the MAA. Recently, there was another organization created, MPSA. 
Well, I don't talk about Mujal, Anzadin or Akwi. What do you expect from the region, even if there is an agreement in Algiers? With this proliferation of groups. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup pour uh, votre question. Uh, je suis très content qu'il y a déjà des gens qui sont partis chez nous, mais aussi surtout des gens qui sont partis à Bamako, donc qui connaissent un peu le système ou en tout cas la situation de façon globale. Euh, je suis membre de la commission des négociations du MNLA, donc je dois être à Alger en ce moment. Oui, mais je vais y être après demain, après la conférence à La Haye, euh, sur les, les peuples, les, les États sans État. Et j'ai été aussi membre de, de la commission des négociations à Ouagadougou qui ont abouti, ces négociations ont abouti à l'accord de cesser le feu euh, du 18 juin 2013 qui a permis l'élection du président de la République, l'actuel Ibrahim Boubacar Keita, Ibeka. Comme beaucoup d'entre vous, vous savez, une négociation, c'est d'abord une confrontation d'arguments et avec des euh, revendications précises. Le MNLA, je l'ai dit, est un mouvement majoritairement d'indépendantistes. Il y a d'autres mouvements qui sont plutôt autonomistes. Et c'est pourquoi nous avons formé une coordination des mouvements de la Zawad, dont vous avez cité la liste, qui sont en belligérance avec Bamako. C'est essentiellement donc MNLA, MAA, Mouvement Arabe de la Zawad, et HCIA. HCIA. Ce sont les trois mouvements qui ont combattu le 21 mai l'armée malienne à Kidal. Et il n'y avait pas dans Sardine. Il n'y avait pas dans Sardine. Il n'y avait pas de mouvement classé terroriste, c'est-à-dire Akmi, Moujao, en Sardine, lors des combats de Kidal du 21 mai dernier. Aujourd'hui, pour vous deux, mais aussi pour tous ceux qui vont sur le terrain, nous avons quelque chose que nous n'avions pas avant. C'est-à-dire qu'aujourd'hui, il y a la communauté internationale, en tout cas les représentants de la communauté internationale dans la Zawad, qui sont témoins de ce qui s'est passé. J'étais le 21 mai à Kidal et j'étais avec les casques bleus et les soldats de l'armée la, de française. D'ailleurs, les corps, excusez-moi, c'est comme ça, les corps et les blessés, euh, ce sont les casques bleus. Nous avons fait appel aux casques bleus pour venir assister donc, à ce qui s'est passé. Donc, il n'y a pas eu, comme euh, certains peuvent le faire euh, croire, de, de présence active d'organisations terroristes, parce qu'il y avait aussi l'armée française. Il y avait les casques bleus aussi à, à Kidal. Les négociations d'Alger sont assez ouvertes. C'est-à-dire qu'on euh, verra à la fin sur quoi les deux parties vont s'entendre. Mais nous savons que le président, ou en tout cas son gouvernement, au début des négociations, avait dit qu'il n'accepte que ces négociations, euh, il n'y aura, aura pas d'indépendance. Il n'y aura pas euh, de fédéralisme, il n'y aura pas d'autonomie. Mais on va voir, parce que si ça veut dire qu'il n'y a rien à, à négocier, pourquoi aller à Alger s'il si n'y a rien à négocier Si, vous voulez faire une remarque, une remarque Oui, mon ami, je vois que vous avez un bon point sur l'area là. Donc vous demandez sur uh, Ayad Agrali, et Mokhtar et Mokhtar et Akni. Je pense que... Uh, you shouldn't ask uh, uh, Emine Law about these people. Uh, it's better, and you will find the good answer in Algerian government. There you can ask about these people, not Emine Law. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, we'll take, uh, we have sort of slightly round up. Let's take one more question in the... Can I ask a question? Yeah, okay. Yeah, about art. Yeah, about art. Good idea. Right. your style what is uh, I wondered what is your aim is your aim to create a work of art you know in doing this or do you really aim for independence of Azawad because that would be interesting I never saw an artist who achieved a political goal Thank you. 
<laughs> well, if, you, if you've never seen an artist that achieves a political goal, then, then there's a big problem. <laughs> because, there, because, because there have been, but, and, and we can talk about it later. Maybe. Uh, what is for me crucial about this project, about this embassy, and also about the debate as we've been having it tonight, is that we're talking in a way about the state as a compository model. I think that is also what Jolle is part, partly addressing. So it's, it actually, the, the question we can ask that we cannot ask in relationship to existing states, or maybe do not ask enough, is the question we ask continually in the concept of the stateless state. What is a state? How can we define, uh, how do we define the legitimacy of a structure of representation? And I think this question of representation is exactly what ties fundamental question of politics to fundamental questions of art. It's like, what are the conditions through which we are represented? Which interests are these located in? What, are, what is the compository model in which this process of representation takes place? So for me, what has been crucial about visiting Azawad and working with other um, groups, other stateless states, is that, is that they are in a way, they are structures that are, they are permanently in construction. Statelessness means that this question, what is a state or what would a state be? What is a, peop what is a peoples? Is a permanent question. And I think this is also the fundamental problem of the acknowledged state, to come to your second question. That is that in the acknowledged state, we start to forget and separate the concept of peoples from the concept of states. So for example, in the Netherlands, we're now in a situation that is so absurd where, we, where people will be able to say, when it comes to, for example, budget cuts in art, <laughs> that the people of the Netherlands in the majority oppose culture which is an absurd distinction. Only in an acknowledged state can you separate the concept of culture from the concept of people. And I think this is the, this is the essence of the idea of, uh, of the art of creating a state. That in the case of Azawad, and also when we visited there, I didn't went there to make an artwork. I tried to recognize the idea of the emergent state and of an insurgent history claiming a state in that, that process as the collective work of art. A collective work of art because the stateless state, different than the acknowledged state, does what art does. It exists, but it also questions the conditions of its own existence. This, I think, is what art can bring to politics. And this, I think, is what politics lacks. The incapacity to reflect on its own presence. And in that sense, I couldn't agree more when Yola suggested, or Yola went into the question of uh, uh, of a constructivism in the sense of art is not outside the real. I would say a progressive art constitutes a different real. And that real exists as far as we tie ourselves to it, as, our, as far as, as we are loyal to it, as far as we act upon it. So if we are here willing to discuss the construct, the composi composition of Azawad, it exists as long as we are here and sustain its existence. And in that sense, I would fully second on Moussa's final statement in his first speech. And that is the question, how do we make, by engaging with the question of the state the state, the 21st century, a century of peoples, and not of states, and at what level can we think of structures that can overcome the limitations and the lack of questioning and the oppressive dimensions of the concept of the state itself? Great Which ending. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Musa, can I ask her for your final impression? Moi, tout d'abord, je voudrais dire que est-ce que c'était possible? C'était la question qu'on se pose souvent. Nous, dans la Zawad, est-ce que c'était possible que les autres entendent notre voix? Que les autres sachent nos souffrances. Que tout simplement les autres sachent que nous existons. Même si nous, nous avons choisi un désert pour y vivre. Et ce qui vient de se faire, ce à quoi vous venez d'assister aujourd'hui, moi je considère que c'est historique. Et si les Américains ont fait, en faisant un pas sur la Lune, un pas pour le monde, nous, nous considérons que nous avons fait un pas pour les peuples. Et pour cela, New World Summit, New World Academy, New World Embassy, c'est un cheminement vers la rencontre, la rencontre des peuples. Pour le moment, 
on est en train de nous faire éloigner et ce serait bien qu'on s'approche et qu'on regarde qu'est-ce qui est commun à nous tous. C'est la, la respiration, c'est le sang. Nous voulons tous vivre heureux, que nous soyons dans la Zawad ou que nous soyons à Utrecht. Et moi, je sens, après avoir fait le, le tour un peu partout, en Europe et ailleurs, qu'il y a quelque chose qui est en train de naître et qui va au-delà du capitalisme, au-delà de, de, des intérêts économiques. Ce sont les droits des peuples collectifs. C'est ce qui va se passer dans quelques jours seulement en Écosse. Ce qui va se passer, je l'espère, dans quelques jours aussi au, au, en Catalogne. Et puis vous verrez, vous verrez que ça va, ça va se passer. Et pour terminer, pour terminer, au nom du MNLA, mais surtout au nom du peuple multiethnique de l'Azawad, et au nom de mon équipe, une partie de l'équipe qui est là, j'excuse le vice-président du MNLA qui n'a pas pu se déplacer, parce qu'il est à Kidal, le président étant à euh, Alger, parce que cette rencontre-là a été décidée depuis un an, alors que les négociations, c'est depuis juillet seulement, depuis le 24 juillet, qu'on sait que ça va se passer en septembre. Donc, au nom de, de tout ce monde-là, et du peuple de la Zawad, je remercie non seulement euh, New World Summit, Jonas et son équipe, mais aussi BAC, Maria et l'équipe de, de BAC, euh, tous ceux qui ont cru à ces projets-là, Merci surtout au peuple hollandais, parce que nous considérons que nous avons une reconnaissance du peuple, parce que ne serait-ce que l'organisation, les deux organisations font partie du peuple. Donc nous avons, nous considérons, peuple azawadien, que nous avons une reconnaissance humaine du peuple hollandais. Je ne peux pas ne pas terminer par la, une pensée aux réfugiés de l'Azawad aux enfants de la Zawad qui n'ont pas accès à l'éducation. Je pense aussi que c'est possible de contribuer au bien-être et à, vraiment à la vie de ces enfants, de ces femmes et de ces hommes qui souffrent, donc par une aide humanitaire. Donc c'est la demande que j'ai à l'égard de la population, du peuple hollandais, c'est une aide humanitaire à l'égard du peuple azawadien. Merci à vous tous ici d'être venus et je vous souhaite tout le bonheur que vous méritez. Merci. Thanks for being here.